Hey everybody, welcome back. Today I've got a treat for you. We're going to take a look at the first of a series of videos that were filmed at the Microhams conference last March 2015. Our first presenter is going to tell us all about DMR, which stands for Digital Mobile Radio. So, grab yourself a cup of tea or coffee, sit back, relax. I think you'll find this both entertaining and educational. Join me now as we enter Building 37 on the Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington. KK7TR. Um, he's going to be our next speaker. Uh, he's going to tell us about um, Motor Turbo or DMR, whichever version you want to name you want to talk about it. Andy, uh, Andy has actually been a ham longer than I am. Uh, 1978, you got your novice? Almost 10 years before I got mine. So I think I got mine in 86. So I've <laughs> been a ham's a long time. Him even longer than I. Uh, Andy's a local communication expert. He's been working in communications and for 20 some years and he's kind of considered the P25 DMR motor turbo guy in the Northwest. I know he kind of brought both of those um, systems to us. Um, he's the main operator of the system on Cougar um, and Baldy, does you claim ownership of Baldy as well? Not ownership of the infrastructure, but I installed it and yeah. you know, I can talk more about it, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, I asked Andy to come talk about DMR or motor turbo because it's uh, alternative to D-Star, alternative to B25, alternative to whatever Yesu thing's called, Fusion. Um, but personally, I think it's a bit more interesting than most of those, and mainly because of the back-end stuff and how they've done the, the talk groups and channeling and all that kind of stuff. I think they've done it a bit more intelligently than, than what ICOM or Yesu. I guess Yesu doesn't even have it, so I shouldn't talk about that. Um, anyway. So, and he's going to give us kind of an introduction to DMR and Motor Turbo, and I gave him a whole seven extra minutes, awesome. so, so he's, he's said he'll happily fill that. I'm not worthy. <laughs> so, uh, let's give a, a hand then to Andy. All right. Thank you. And the first thing I want to do is, Penny, I want to uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the invitation to come back. I, I presented here a couple years ago. And it's always a pleasure to be able to share this kind of information. And as Kenny pointed out, during my day job, I work for a consulting engineering company. And what we do is we're involved in designing land mobile radio systems, mostly for public safety. And it's kind of ironic that I never thought I'd see the day where I, I would see commercial or public safety or utility grade communications technology kind of ebb and flow over to the amateur radio side. But it's actually happened. And... Um, if some of you remember me a couple years back, I was a big proselytizer of uh, P25, and I still am. I think it's an incredible protocol um, made, made possible by a, a big influx of used equipment that's available on the used market. Um, DMR, what we're going to learn about is another technology, very similar, very capable, that has been fielded and has also, in my personal, professional opinion, it's taken off like gangbusters in amateur radio and, and offers some really incredible um, capabilities. I could spend easily three hours talking about DMR and all the various um, uh, inceptions that are being used around the world. I just came back from Las Vegas. There's a big international wireless trade show that they have every year called IWCE, and I've been there for about 13, 14 years. And this year, there were 16 DMR manufacturers that were present at the show. Now, about 12 of those were out of Shenzhen, China, but... Uh, <laughs> But there are a lot of, well, we're going to talk about all this. So anyway, without much further ado, let's go ahead and start into the uh, presentation, and hopefully I can uh, talk about this. Um, let's talk about DMR. We talk about standards, and everybody in here are familiar with different digital standards, protocols, rules, regulations. ETSI, which is the European uh, Terrestrial Standards Institute, uh, Technology Standards Institute, if I'm not mistaken, is responsible for all of the standards that apply to radio communications. This is analogous to TIA or EIA here in the United States. Digital mobile radio has 
been an open standard. It was ratified in the mid-2000s, and it is available for public download. If you want to build a DMR radio, you can go to the website, download. There's about four or five major documents that goes down to the bits, bytes, protocol timing, frames, super frames, air interface, level one, level two, level three, anything you want to know about DMR. You got the will and you got the, the money and whatever, and you want to build yourself a DMR radio, you have at it. It is an open protocol, an open standard. There's no licensing except for one that we'll talk about later uh, that gets you into DMR. DMR is defined in what they call three phases or three tiers. Tier one is actually an unlicensed version of the radio that's, that's pretty much sold everywhere outside the United States. It's license free. It's the equivalent of FRS. The funny thing about tier one is guess what frequency it's available in everywhere around the world? Anybody have a guess? 446 megahertz. Go figure. But anyway, that's used in other, uh, other regions, ITU regions of the world for the equivalent of what we know as uh, FRS. Tier two is what I'm going to talk about, and that's for conventional director repeated non-trunk communication. And that deals with simplex, this is licensed, simplex, repeat, multi-site conventional, everything but trunking. And then the last tier is called tier three and that is primarily a spec that's written around wide area trunking system that defines the control channel protocol, how calls are set up, how calls are brought down, how emergencies are processed, all of that kind of stuff. Down here, this shows a little bit about in the market of the, uh, of the world where DMR is. And I'm sorry, some of these are hard to see, but 28% of the market is primarily for industrial type communications. Another 23 is transport. Only 14 is public safety and what we would call public safety EMS, and about 11% is utilities. So a lot of people are saying, well, is this a replacement for P25? Absolutely not. My personal, professional opinion, there's no reason why DMR could not be used for public safety. It has all the, the attributes, the call, call side, it has all the performance, pretty much mil, mil A10 spec rays. It could easily be used for public safety, but that is a political hot button. I'm not touching that with a 20-foot pole, or if you're in Europe, a 20-meter pole, right? I'm not touching it. But where you do see it is power companies, transit organizations, utilities, PUDs, campuses. This Corporation right here and Microsoft actually owns a Moto Turbo network. A lot of people don't realize every, every Microsoft campus in the world is linked together on a DMR system. The security uh, for here, uh, that's, that's common knowledge. You can look it up on the internet. Uh, so anyway, it is what we call a utility grade communications uh, solution. A little bit of the background, I kind of covered some of that. It has wide sec widespread acceptance internationally and in the United States. Um, the biggest proliferator of DMR in the United States is actually Motorola, and they have a trademark name called Moto Turbo, T-R-B-O, and that is their flavor, their special sauce of DMR. I will say that Moto Turbo in Tier 3, the trunking, is not compatible with Tier 3 DMR. They did their own private, their own proprietary implementation of that to give themselves some market competitiveness. And I'm, I'm sure everybody's just floored and you're just devastated. You, you can never believe Motorola would do something like that, right? But yeah, that, it is. It's a little bit different. Very popular in Europe. Um, everybody talks about, you know, when I first started talking about P25, people fell over. Andy, what, you think I'm going to drop $1,500 for a portable radio? No, I can't afford that. Of course, eBay brought the the price is down because there were first and second generation P25 radios that were being surplused out of government uh, agencies and they're available for a couple hundred to high hundreds on eBay. Right now you can get DMR units brand new about $400 to $800. Okay? There's one company down in California that has been the cause for this inrush of interest in DMR, uh, Connect Systems. Uh, they're selling a, a model called a CS700 that's in, imported out of China about $190 um, with the programming cable and the software, portable, DMR. Um, repeaters, they are very economically priced, about $1,500 to $2,000 for a new Part 90 commercial grade repeater uh, that you can buy directly from the manufacturer. Again, we talked about the recent entry of Chinese manufacturers. And this has been internationally adopted for amateur radio use. Now, when I say adopted, I'm not going to go so far and say that it's been blessed or, you know, the ARR. I'm just going to say that it is what it is. It's being used all around the world for amateur radio. It is truly a mixed mode capability. The radios can be programmed for analog and digital. 
when you get that DMR radio, you get that DMR repeater, um, you're not necessarily locked into only digital radio. Um, you can use it for narrowband or standard deviation uh, FM operation. If your club or whoever wants to use that, uh, you're, not, you're not cutting yourself out of any particular mode of operation. So let's talk a little bit about call types. And DMR or digital operation is a little bit different. It's, in some ways, it's very analogous to analog operation, but sometimes things are a little bit different. When you're on a network or even a repeater, it's, again, it's, it's heritage draws from commercial slash public safety type operation. And that is typically where you can make a call to a group or an individual. And when I say an individual, that means that literally only your radio and their radio open squelch, only you two can hear each other. Anybody else on the channel that would not have your particular ID or uh, individual call ID would not necessarily be able to listen to you. Now, that doesn't mean it's encrypted. It just means that if you got the right ID, you listen. It's, no, it's analogous. If your radio was only PL, only CTCSS, and you didn't have that same PL, you wouldn't hear them. Doesn't mean it's encrypted, but it's me it's, it means that it's intended for private communications. There's other things that you can do on the network where it's a one to many or a one to all. Uh, you can light up a broadcast call and literally light up every repeater in the network and everybody's radio on that network would open squelch and you'd hear the transmission. There's some other things that we don't really use that much in amateur radio and that's the priority and emergency call. And all that means is in a call, if, if the system were busy or there was a call queue, you would go to the top of the prior, priority or if it was an emergency, you could literally preempt a conversation and process. You and, you, know, you and me are talking and all of a sudden, boom, our conversation goes away and an emergency priority call takes our channel so that they can communicate. Again, this is from its public safety uh, or commercial type uh, days. Polite, impolite channel access. Everybody talk, you know, you know you, everybody here knows busy tone lockout, busy channel lockout uh, on the analog side. It's the same thing, except there's even more. With that, uh, depending on this politeness mode that you select, your radio, if there's a conversation, a call in process, it might not interrupt, or it actually may interrupt the call, and the other two people would hear you talk. Uh, it's a type of access uh, pro protocol. I'll be the first one to admit I am not a data guru, and I'm not going to pretend to know, say, I proliferate knowledge of Ethernet and IP and IP routing and all that kind of stuff, but it, it is data. It's, it's, it's a, it is IP. It supports IP type data messaging. I believe it supports IP version 6. And there is an entire document you can download for free that talks about PDUs, uh, logical link layers, all that kind of stuff if you want to know about how IP data is routed from radio to radio or across the network. It, su it supports short data messaging. You can text people just like uh, an SMS from your text phone to other people. Some other things like radio check and location, you can transmit uh, a GPS location. You can also find out if another radio is on the network without them even knowing. You can literally ping their radio. It'll come back and let you know if they're available, their, their availability status. So you can actually find out if Jim is, if he's, if he's on the network, if his radio is actually turned on and available. So what's a DMR radio look like? Well, five or six years ago, you only had a, a very small bunch. But right now, you have lots of different choices. These tiers are not analogous to the ETSI tiers of the protocol. We kind of call them tier one, tier two, tier three. And that comes from the public safety world, where you got a basic radio that has maybe an LCD or no LCD uh, or no keypad, a tier two where you, you have a key, you have a display, but maybe a couple buttons, a couple keys, or you can have a full a tier three radio where you got the full shebang. You got the you may have a multi-segment or a multi-line LCD. You got all the keys needed, up, down, left, right, you know, shuttle jog, all that kind of stuff. And what's really neat, if you're into two-way radios that look like cell phones, DMR has a bunch of these. And literally, they look, uh, they, there's an example right over here. Uh, this is like the size of the old, uh, oh, the old like CDMA, first generation CDMA cell phones. But um, there's several different versions that are out there that are, they're like about two to three watts and uh, very pocketable, look just like a, a cell phone. These are, all <coughs> these are all part 90 radios, not part 97. You're free to use them in Part 97 service. Part 90 radios typically have much higher specs than you're ever going to get on an amateur, tr an amateur radio in terms of its frequency stability, in terms of its adjacent channel selectivity, um, all of that stuff. It is a commercial grade radio. 
you're free to use it in amateur service. So the first thing somebody's going to say, are they front panel programmable? Some are, yes. In generally, generally not. But yes, some are front panel programmable, and that depends on the make and model and uh, who you know. <laughs> Available on, on all of the amateur bands, uh, with the exception of six meters, nothing on low band, nothing on 220. They are available on 900, uh, ironically, some makes and models, but primarily V and UHF. The only thing you have to be careful on UHF is there's usually two ranges, 403 to 470, and then 450 to 520. So if you're buying one of these, either new or used on eBay, you want to make sure you get the 403 to 470 spread so that you can use it for um, 70 centimeter or amateur 440. So what's a DMR repeater look like? Well, there's a lot. The first implementation uh, that Motorola did on the Moto Turbo was called the XPR 8300 series. XPR 8300, 8400 series. And this is, a, this is a photograph of one that I installed. I popped the cover and I, I thought it'd be good to show everybody what's inside. But yes, it is two mobiles in a rack. Now, don't be dissuaded too much because they are two part 90 radios, mobile radios. What Motorola did over here, you can see what they did is they they milled into the pop heat sink a flat space and on the extruded aluminum heat sink, and they put in a bigger, heavier heat sink on top of the mobile that's going to be used as the transmitter to get a little bit more surface area. And the cooling fan on this, when I turned it on, it, w it sounded like a turbine engine spooling up, and it was blowing papers on the, off my desk about six or eight feet away. So they, they got the uh, airflow going really good through these things. But anyway, as you can see, it's a 20, you know, 19 inch rack mount. Two mobiles, control logic, Ethernet, um, everything in there to, to manage that. Now, up in the right corner, is anybody familiar with the Motorola MTR series, MTR 2000 repeater? Okay, this is the MTR 3000. This is the next generation that is a DMR repeater, and that's Motorola's high end solution for DMR. If you have an MTR 2000, you can, with the proper application of money, upgrade it to an MTR 3000 and change out the applicable modules to take you from analog to DMR digital. So, cost effective at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought, just want to make sure. Just, I'll shoot straight from the hip. Uh, if I had enough money to upgrade from MTR to, to MTR 3000, I'd buy two or three of the XPRs, okay? That's, that's just me. Um, but anyway, despite being two mobiles in the box, extremely low failure rate. These things run forever. Uh, these are about 30 to 40 watt um, power range in terms of what you're going to get out of these. Um, remember, you're buying one repeater, as we're going to soon find out, it's TDMA time slot. You're buying one repeater, but you're getting two channels. You're getting two talk paths out of that. Two simultaneous conversations can occur on that in that one box. So let's not focus just on Motorola. What do other DMR repeaters look like? Well, there's lots. Um, these are some examples out of Europe and China. This is a Sapora. This is a Tate. That's a Simoco, that's a Hytera out of China. This is also a Hytera. This is a really neat company out of Italy that is producing these. Something that's interesting, and I'm, I'm torn, I'm torn because to me, the business end of a repeater is an end connector and a, you know, a big honking 12 volt power connector. Now, they're showing the business end of a repeater. What do we have, an ethernet jack? I'm devastated. It should be the other way around, right? All this IP stuff, but anyway, um, what is interesting is they're now starting to make DMR repeaters in small form factors that can be bolted up against the wall. And what's happening is they're starting to approach like an access point type of approach. Because these are all Ethernet backhaul, you know, you can literally start linking these things. In the old paradigm, you had mountaintop towers, big antennas, 100, 150 watts ERP. But now with this, with the cost and the form factor, you can get into more of a distributed type of approach and architecture. You, you, want, you have a ham club on the Microsoft campus. Well, you don't need to depend on the Cougar Mountain repeater. You can put one of these on the campus. It's a little antenna, backhaul into the network, and you got your connectivity, you got your, your communications right there. <laughs> of course. Well, of course, you know, the, the lower form factor, these are probably five to 15 watt units. Yes? Coordination at the 
So the question was, is there any issues with coordination? That's the guy to talk to right there. He did, uh, he did my coordination, and I, I, it was like three Anthony's Steakhouse? Yes, Anthony's yes. Anthony's Seafood, yeah. 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 <laughs> so <laughs> Free meals? <laughs> coordination, at least in Western Washington, is about not interfering with other people. So if you can share frequency or a geographical area with someone else, that, that's completely fine. You, you could have lots of low power uh, repeaters on the air all on the same frequency as long as there's just some geographical separation and, and the, the power's kept low. Now, and, and I don't want to burn up a whole lot of time yet with questions, but there is the other issue where back in the day some non-progressive thinking people said, this needs to be in the packet portion of the band because this is data. And there's some states as I'm that I'm familiar with where this is down on 430 coordinations. Now, and I'm not going to get into that. All I'm going to say is it shouldn't. Voice is voice, whether the modulations, you know, my opinion, data or analog. These are standard narrowband repeaters, and I don't know why they would need to be treated special or separate, but here in western Washington, they're on the same coordinated reserve frequency pairs as anywhere else, I believe, right? Yeah, they are in Western Washington, although I believe Oregon, and I'm looking at Jeremy, who's not there, I think they stuck them down, um, down in the 430 range, down in Oregon. I'm sorry, what? So Oregon does strange stuff. Oregon does strange stuff, yeah. There you go. Well, but Oregon they can do that. They don't charge tax. <laughs> this is true. They do, they're not so close to the, the magic line as we are. So anyway, moving right along, let's get into a little bit of a technical background. And again, in the limited time I have, I'm going to try to spread things around so you get a little bit of a technical overview, operational overview. Let's talk about the technical background of what DMR is. Number one, it's 12 and a half kilohertz bandwidth. It's half the bandwidth of those Neanderthal analog repeaters that everybody still wants to use. Half the bandwidth. It is C4FM. It's also known as four level FSK. It's the frequency shift king. You have an inner set and an outer set of deviation points. And those are used to create die bits, what are called symbols, and that is the basis of how the digital bit pattern is created. So if you were to look at this on a spectrum analyzer or on a communications analyzer, down here you have what's called a histogram or a, a, a deviation frequency distribution plot. You can see that there are four dis discrete deviation levels, plus and minus 1944 and plus and minus 648. And you will, your radio transceiver will only transmit, deviate on the carrier, on the frequency modulation offset to one of those four points at a certain time in a certain sequence. The advantage of 12 and a half kilohertz and especially TDMA, which we're going to talk about in a second, is that you can get more carriers per bandwidth and then within that bandwidth you can get two conversations within that 12 and a half kilohertz made possible by time division multiplexing, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Now, C4FM is the same frequency modulation protocol that's used by APCO Project 25. It's also used by NXDN, if anybody are familiar with ICOM IDAS or Kenwood NextEdge. This is a, a narrowband FM. They're actually six and a quarter. They're half of that in frequency FDMA. But anyway, it uses four-level FSK. And the new Yaesu Fusion product is also 12 and a half kilohertz uh, C4FM FSK. It's very, very, very close to Project 25 in its modulation format. One of the things that makes C4FM and one of the things that makes P25, NXDN, DMR, in my opinion, superior to everything out there, has to do with the error correction. Now, I'm not going to get into, you guys have been playing with modems for years, have been playing with packet AAX.25. The, it doesn't matter how good your, your radio transmitter is, how well it's aligned. The reality is those radio signals undergo multipath, they undergo fade, they undergo all different kind of stuff. And what is it that actually makes sure that the signal comes through on the other end in digital modes? It's the error correction. Long story short, years ago, a whole lot of PhD mathematicians from the United States and from India and from all around the world got together and they developed all these error correction algorithms. And these were, are, were implemented in the vocoder and in the hardware that these radios use. So all I'm going to say is you're probably 
outside of the Department of Defense, you're pro in my opinion, you're probably not going to get a radio protocol that has more forward error correction capabilities than for the channel bandwidth that you're using. Remember, you've got a very low data rate than what you're seeing right now. It uses a vocoder known as AMBI, okay? It's a multiband excitation. It's a synthetic vocoder. It do, literally, what you're hearing on this thing is its best approximation of what you sound like. It's not you. When you listen to that thing, it sounds like you. It is not you. It is a lookup table. It samples your voice. It, in this model, this synthetic speech uh, of, of glottal tones, it picks the shh of your shut up that sounds closest to what it should be, picks that out of a lookup table, recreates it. And it, amazingly, it sounds like you, but it's not you. Remember the old thing from the 1970s, is it real or is it Memorex? Remember those uh, old commercials? Uh, that's what this thing is doing. And it's doing this at 2,400 bits per second, okay? It, it's absolutely amazing what it does for the amount of low data rate that, it, that it's using. Very high voice quality, very robust against background noise, against a proven technology. These are the same vocoders that are used in APCO Pro Project 25 um, and some other digital protocols. Um, many of you may have seen this graph. This is the typical analog versus digital performance over a Synad signal to noise uh, over, uh, over distortion level and attenuation. And where analog has this kind of gradual decrease down into the noise, digital, under most conditions, will hold the recovered audio quality better and longer, but when you do hit that bit error rate limit, a little bit above six, seven percent, it does drop off more rapidly. So what does that mean? Is it always superior to analog? No, but your, how do they say that? In fact, they use that in Microsoft, don't they? The Microsoft user experience? Isn't that what they call it? Your user experience? Your user experience with digital is different than analog, and what you typically have is a very comfortable, quality, you know, uh, uh, um, high fidelity type of audio to the point where then in it, it just drops off suddenly. It's a little bit different. Um, TDMA. This uses time division multiple access. The frames are in 30 millisecond chunks. Uh, again, this is all from the standards document. You can download and look at it. 30%, 30 millisecond slot, 50% duty cycle. We're going to talk about that in a second. If you want to go into the payload size, you can look at this. Two headers, 108 bits. Um, there's a 200. Let's, let's kind of stop right here because this is important. When you press, when you push to talk, you think you're transmitting, but your radio is actually turning. It's, trans, it's switching between receive and transmit every 30 milliseconds. And when you receive something on DMA, what you're actually hearing is a, it's actually, you're getting syllabic content every 30 milliseconds that's being reassembled for you. And because a human here at 30 millisecond time intervals can't tell the difference, you think it sounds like a continuous flowing voice. But actually, your radio is turning on and off every 30 milliseconds as it transmits these headers. And this two and a half millisecond guard time that's between here. It's very interesting. They had to put that in there. And the reason they had to put that in there is twofold. We'll talk about this in a second, but do FM transmitters rise from zero to full carrier instantaneously? No. It takes time, right? Is the speed of light given a certain amount of time? Is it, is it instant? No, right? There's propagation delays. So they had to put that in there because the reality is without the injection of future, you know, without the injection of more alien technology from Roswell, we're limited to what we can build right now, right? Come on, that was funny. Jeez. All right. <laughs> so the reality is, so reality is, this is a, a, an emission mask that's based in time, and the red is what you're looking at and what your performance is. So everybody knows this is kind of like a typical ringing, dampening, you know, of a, of a transmitter rise time. So there are very, very tight specs for DMR transmitters. And basically, by the time you enter this slot time, this has to be stabilized within what's called zero dBp of where it's actually supposed to be. So anyway, the power ramp time is very important. Your transmitted power needs to be stable. You can't be, you know, varying in power. And then we're going to, as you can imagine, 
there's clock. There's a clock oscillator in these radios, and they have to be very, very accurate because if your time drifts, then that whole frame sequence, and everybody knows about latency and delay. Um, this is one of the things that they had to uh, account for. And this is actually off of a service monitor showing them measuring. Here's one 30 second, one 30 millisecond frame. And this shows the stability of the carrier here. It's very beautiful, nice and, nice and straight. And then the drop off before the next frame starts. Um, also, here's your four deviation points. Plus and minus 1944, plus and minus 648. There's your four die bit data symbol creation points in C4FM. So we just talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, with timing, you got to be really careful. Um, and here's another thing. Think about this. You have a repeater. And maybe I'm a block away from it. So my delay is almost instantaneous. But Joe, he's 35 miles out down the valley. So the time perception from the, the, the repeater standpoint is I'm very, very close, almost no delay. He's out at the fringe. And if you look at those, those frames going past, it's that, that window you know, that it keeps looking at. And where is that data arriving in that window? If you get too far out of that window, you have problems. So actually, there is, there's actually a terrestrial limit to what DMR can work, work in. And it's about 75 to 80 kilometers, which is about 45 to 50 miles. Now, people say, oh, gee, what are we going to do? I can't talk more than 50 miles. Um, it was never designed for tropo scatter, OK? It was designed as a land mobile radio protocol. And 50 miles between is a repeater. You got a 100-mile radius. It's still not that bad considering what you get. And this is not endemic just to DMR. There's some other digital protocols. They had issues with some of the early cellular systems. And something I wanted to mention, DMR is not the only protocol that uses TDMA. Uh, the first cellular, digital cellular protocol, IS-136, back in the late 80s and the 90s, that was TDMA. Remember the Nextel phones? Motorola Nextel, IDEN technology? That was three, I believe, three slot, tech, three slot TDMA. So TDMA has been used for a long time. Um, so how do you program DMR radius? They're very, very similar to analog in your, your basic stuff. Um, each radio has an ID that needs to be entered, and that is what identifies you. And when you get, and we're going to talk a little bit about more of the, the network stuff, that ID is going to be linked to your call sign, and that's going to form your push-to-talk ID, and that's what's going to validate you on the network. Um, in the DMR world, you know, in the analog world, you think of CTCSS, you think of, uh, you know, uh, the, the transmit frequency, receive frequency. In DMR, you still have that, but they have what's called a color code. And you can think of that, it's one, it's, it ranges from 1 to 15, and that's sort of like your CTCSS tone in the analog world. And then, of course, you're talking into the repeater, free, uh, aside from your frequency, you have to, the repeater has to know and your radio has to know when I make this call, am I going to transmit on slot one or slot two? All right. So when, when you make up, when you call between two people, when you create that group, that talk group, you have to work out what color code the repeater is going to respond to, and then what time slot it is going to uh, transmit on. And this is just a uh, code plug from a, a Motorola radio. Now these ID codes that I was talking about, these can be individual codes, or they could be a group code. And if you look down here, for example, these are actual uh, DMR amateur users, and these are their individual IDs. These are talk groups, okay? And as you can see, they use different ranges of ID ranges. This is a North America talk group. It's a 3000 series. This is a wide area talk group, very low decimal range. And then the actual individual users, according to where in the United States, North America you are, they actually have this all um, worked out as far as ID ranges. So benefits. It's a worldwide standard. Right now, there's over six really large, reputable, known manufacturers of DMR equipment. There's some of them up here. You're familiar with Vertex Standard, Motorola, Tate. Um, right now, ICOM and Kenwood are not producing DMR, although I believe Kenwood has plans to in the very near future. Um, superior voice quality over older digital modes. Now, this is interesting. If you only, when, you, when, you, when you transmit, if your radio is only keying on and off 50% of the time, then you're only draining your battery 50% as much as you would in analog operation. So there's a very compelling argument that with TDMA, 
you're going to get longer battery life out of your transceiver because, again, your transmit cycle is only 50% of what it would be in regular FM operation or, or phase modulation. Uh, you can support multiple groups in one channel, supports data applications, simultaneous voice and data, and of course the commercial specs, these are very, very high quality radios. I'm not saying that amateur radios are not high quality because you can get them with IP specs and mil spec A10. I'm just saying these are uh, built to part 90 specifications in terms of performance and typically the packaging and the, the housing on them are, are pretty, uh, pretty good as well. So let's talk a little about networking. So I'm going to start with Motorola because the current amateur networks that are built around it was built around Motorola's Moto Turbo protocol, which was known as IP Site Connect. And the way that Motorola does this and the way that my, many of the other, am, uh, the other uh, DMR manufacturers do this, they have conventional operation. They have a thing what's called automatic roaming. Your DMR repeater can be programmed to beacon. Once a second, once every 10 seconds, you can define the, 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 the beacon duration and the beacon, beacon cycling. And your radios, your DMR radio, can listen to that. And it's, it's sort of like a trunking thing where it, it's a roaming uh, algorithm where, for example, we have a repeater down in Baldy Mountain. We have one up in Linwood. If we wanted to, we could set those up to beacon as if you were, and, and we have one in Baldy, Cougar, Linwood, and one hopefully soon up at Fraley Mountain. You could be driving up Interstate 5, and your radio could be constantly scanning, looking for that beacon. And when the signal, the RSSI of that beacon goes below a certain strength, it automatically scans and looks for the other beacons and picks up the one that's the, the pick of the litter. And then your radio automatically roams over, changes over to that repeater. So you could literally drive up and down I-5, and you could not have to touch the knob on your radio because your radio would automatically home in on the best repeater for your location. And that's nothing new in the commercial world. They've been doing that for decades. But for amateur radio, it, it is kind of neat. Um, IP linking of repeater sites, by design, DMR repeaters were designed for fairly easy uh, IP linking, uh, the beaconing capability. And of course, each of these radios has its own addressable, has its own IP address. So you exist as, a, as an individual ID. You exist as a unique IP address on the network. The linking and how you do it was never defined by ETSI. They dealt more with the air interface, the, the, the over-the-air protocol, the packet data. But as far as how you want to connect your repeaters up, they, they, they stayed out of that. They let the manufacturers determine how to do it. And I guess that was both good and bad. It was good because it let the manufacturers do what they want. The bad thing is if you have six or eight different DMR systems made by different manufacturers, you may not have a common, a common way to link these together for, let's just say, seamless uh, interoperation. Motorola did a proprietary networking scheme that they marketed as IP Site Connect. And it was originally limited to 15 sites and 100 users. So the current amateur networks, the larger ones, are based on IP Site Connect. But you're saying, well, gee, 15 repeaters, 100 users, well, that obviously is not going to work. So a company, and I don't know much of the history behind this, but there's a company in the Midwest known as Rayfield Communications, and they developed this Seabridge product, which is a router, specialized server router. And this allows you to take one IP Site Connect network, connect it up to this, and route it to as many, or literally almost to, to as many other similar networks as you want. And by doing this, and I'm assuming, again, I'm not the, the IP expert, but I'm assuming they have routing tables, and they have address ranges, and it does all this translation so that you can build this super network out of smaller Motorola IP Site Connect networks. And that's currently what they're doing all around the world is based on this Seabridge product. So amateur radio and DMR. There are a lot of DMR amateur radio networks. Some of them were put up just by a couple people that want to put something together. Some are from larger you know, organizations. The two biggest ones are here in North America are known as DCI and MARC. And MARC stands for the Motorola Amateur Radio Club. And they are the ones that actually started this out. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's very interesting the type of people that you meet on DMR when you get involved in conversation. There's some credible people that have been in the industry for, for many years. Uh, but it all started with MARC, the Motorola Amateur Radio Club. Um, these are pin, pin pushes of all the different DMR sites uh, around the world. 
the one that we have here in the Pacific Northwest is on DCI. And these are examples of other ones, Northern California, Nor New Jersey, North Colorado, San Francisco Turbo, Arizona, DMR Mark Canada. They have a, a network, you know, obviously all across uh, Canada. Some small ones that are primarily individuals, you know, this guy here in Kansas, um, Georgia, Rocky Mountain, Australia, North Carolina, Illinois, all over the place. They're all brought together to a central bridge and you push to talk and you can light up the repeater that you have in your backyard. You can light up one that's in, in your state, all the repeaters in your state. You can light up all that are in a geographical region. You can light them all up in North America or you, you can light them up all around the world in different partition talk groups. Just a little bit of a background here in this area. We have a repeater on Baldy. These are all UHF by the way. Cougar Mountain, uh, is Terrence here? He's not going to be here until this afternoon. Oh, okay. There is a Microhams member that just put up a local repeater at his residence. And I think he's going to try to get it up to a higher location, but there's one here in uh, downtown Redmond, one in uh, near Linwood, and another one that hopefully would be going up on Fraley Mountain in Skagit County in the near future. And these are all part of what we call the Pacific Northwest, Pacific Northwest Group on DCI. And these are the names of the talk groups that you can select on your radio and bring up and, and call. Now what's missing from this picture, I didn't get up north, is there's also two repeaters up in Vancouver, BC that are also part of the Pacific Northwest Network. And these again are the frequencies, um, your color codes that remember we talked about before, and their locations. There's also some work right now at an analog level to link P25 and to link Yesu Fusion over to the DMR network so that we can do testing between different digital systems. The two websites, the www.turbo.org and the www.dmr-mark.net, they're fantastic websites. In fact, when you want to get on the network to get an ID, you have to register here. They give everything. They give a background about the technology, about how to program your repeater. They actually have default software files, data files that helps you get started to program your radio, kind of gives you a head start. Um, talk about the protocol, the history. Um, this is what's really interesting and I have to admit that the, the funnest thing about ham radio is meeting interesting people that share a passion, a background about the hobby. What's very interesting is a lot of the people on DMR you typically find a couple of types. There are people that are looking to push the limit and get involved in something. They're not the ones that are going down the big highway. They're the ones that are looking for the side roads of interest to, to kind of learn about different facets of technology. So you, so you find those people on there. There's also a lot of people that are involved in the industry. You know what I mean by the industry? They're radio technicians that work at two-way radio shops. They're public safety employees. There are people that are, you know, in engineers and, and are involved in uh, wireless communications and one of the nicest things I've found about the network is just the type of people that you meet on there and I'm talking to some guy in Illinois you know about I was talking with him about Nextel and IDEN because we were talking about TDMA technology the guy was a retired engineer that like worked on the repeaters at Motorola that they used in IDEN technology and I'm like talking to the guy that like developed and designed this stuff I'm like you know humble just like taught you know meeting people like this um, very fascinating people that are there, very helpful. I mean, these people, are, they will go out of their way to, you know, teach you what you need to know and give you advice and, and help you out. So, and I, I really enjoy that. Um, there have been some people I've found that, that, have, that have played for D-Star for a couple years and they heard about this and they wanted to try to test the waters and see, you know, how is it the same, how is it different than D-Star and the entry level radios, the low price of the radios is actually an, an, an enabler for people to get on here, if you're only going to invest $200, it's pretty low risk. If you like it, boy, what a great investment. If you don't like it, you haven't, you know, invested a thousand bucks into something that you weren't really sure about, only to find out it wasn't for you. So it's been it's been pretty good. I went through this really fast, and um, again, I can't really do I can't give do credit and talk about DMR in the amount of time that I have, but I wanted to touch about those different aspects of DMR. So I guess the good thing now is we have some time for questions and I hope uh, there's lots and we can get a Just go. a second. We're going to try to do this differently. Um, 
I w messed up and I didn't hand out the microphone, so we're going to run their microphone. Yeah, Bob W7AVK. I believe when you were here a couple several years ago talking about P25, yes, you made the comment that uh, the federal the feds would only supply money for P25, or the radio had to go to P25. P25. Now, where does this system fit in that mix? So that's correct. So DHS had a lot of federal grants that were made available, and the stipulation was, as you just said, the radio was either P25 capable or could it was exactly. And there's one particular local manufacturer that took incredible. Uh, they were very smart because they produced radios that were analog but were P25 capable by the addition of a board, and that technically qualified them for grant funding. So yes. DMR does not fall under any federal grant funding, to my knowledge, because it is not considered a government standard that, and, and here's something to realize. The not this no, and, but what I want to mention is, um, there is, there is there's no federal law or mandate, don't let anybody tell you otherwise, there's no federal law on the books that say you must Embrace, you must adopt P25 technology. It's unless you want the money. Unless you want the money. Yeah. Okay? So there's a lot of analog public safety users still existing, and there will be for a long time. But no, DHS grant funding does not apply to DMR. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Randy and 7 cje uh, Question on the protocol of handling this digital communication. Could this also support simultaneously um, video or uh, imagery processing? Well, theoretically, yes. Um, I think we went back to the channel, the channel bit rate. We're talking about 400, I think with the overhead and the error correction, we're talking about a 4,800 bit per second channel. So it is not, it was never designed, you know, for that. Could you theoretically take a JPEG and partition it into little chunks and then reassemble on the other end, theoretically you could. And I will say there are a lot of third party manufacturers that are making a lot of stuff for DMR because the remote control protocol and the IP protocol that's used for DMR, it's all open. So there's a lot of companies making, for example, um, PC dispatchers to dispatch and take control of radio, um, a lot of fleet management, AVL, automatic vehicle location, GPS type stuff. So there's a lot of that stuff that's out there, and you can do it. But as far as using it as a medium, a medium for um, high bandwidth data, no, absolutely not. But something on the line of uh, possibly you would take a digital television signal, and then we're going to be able to do a capture, media time slice, in a very highly compressed mode mm -hmm. using compression algorithm. I wonder if something on the line could be supported for emergency or uh, for just monitoring or something like that. You're mm -hmm. literally taking just few milliseconds of time slice of a photograph. Well, <clears throat> I know that video capture is being demonstrated with other similar C4 FM systems of relatively similar similar data rates. I'm not going to say I, I don't know. Theoretically, anything's possible, right? I know with the, um, what is it, DRATS? D-Star, D-Rats, I think on ICOMs, you know, their 1.2 gig version radio, the, you can get some pretty good, you know, bandwidth data rates up there. Again, and, and I'm going to just call a spade a spade. This protocol was designed for high quality, low bandwidth voice. It was just designed as a, a high quality digital voice mode. Anything that you overlay on top of that is sort of like icing on the cake. GPS, AVL, NEMA data, short data, text messaging, sure. Above that, you're, you're you know, you're kind of a kind of a test pilot, I think. Andy, you mentioned the no federal funding thing for commercial radios that don't support P25. That's all true, but there are some exceptions. Which outside of DHS? Uh, well, no, no. State level? No, the exceptions are uh, for application-specific things. Low band VHF, for example. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as a low band VHF P25 radio, so you don't have that doesn't have to qualify. Okay. Air band isn't you, there's no P25 used in air band. If you buy an air band radio, you can use federal funds. Uh, amateur radios are not generally P25 radios, so amateur radios or potentially radios that are used for amateur applications. Okay. So it's possible. I don't know anybody's ever tried, but. Uh, I'll try. It does exist out there it, somewhere? It's possible that we could actually qualify, if we're trying to hook to this DMR network mm -hmm. uh, for amateur radio purposes, that you could, in fact, actually fund it as an amateur radio. Okay. We'll have to test it. All right. There was uh, a 
a question. More. Here we go. So in the uh, DMR environment, do the concepts of crossband repeating and simplex apply at all? Everything you've talked about has been repeaters. Crossband repeating, uh, okay, so when I think of crossband repeating, I think of the, um, the amateur dual band mobile that you program it up and one channel on V, one channel on U and any Audi. Um, that type of radio doesn't exist yet. I don't know of any dual band DMR radio that exists uh, currently. That may change in the future. But you could certainly have a site where you have a VHF repeater and a UHF repeater tied into the same talk group, program for the same talk group. So when I key up on Washington 1 on UHF, I automatically come out on any repeater. Because from the network level, the network, this I've got to be careful, it's not a switch. The router, I believe the, the appropriate name would be the router, it, it, it has no concept of whether you're V or U. You're just an IP address, and it routes that audio to those IP addresses that are part of that group. So you could literally have two repeaters at a site, V and U, programmed on the same talk group, addressable, and you could come in on V and, and got on U and vice versa. But as far as a, a box, I'm not uh, aware of that. Um, I could see... <laughs> I can see like in the Motorola example where you've got two mobiles in, in, in a box and take out one of those and put a, a V on that side and a U on the other. The problem with that is in the, the programming software, there probably does not exist because when you, when you read those radios, there's a model number that comes back and that software knows from that model number what the range is. And I, it's very interesting. I don't know uh, theoretically, but I think uh, at the software programming level that would be a tough thing to do. Okay, we never talked about simplex. So simplex operation with DMR is kind of interesting um, because when you talk through a repeater, the repeater is sort of the arbitrator and the synchronization source for that, that timing. When you take the repeater out of the equation, that's gone. So what happens is in direct mode, Whoever keys up first starts as a master and starts the timing synchronization, and the other radio goes off of that. Now, and, and this is something I should know more of. I believe in the early days of DMR, when you when you fell back to direct mode, what they call direct mode, DMO, that's the commercial way of saying simplex. It was my understanding that you went to the full 12 and a half kilohertz bandwidth, and you were not TDMA, you were FDMA. All right. But now I believe that you can do TDMA. And here's something that's very interesting. And this is, they're currently in the process of implementing this right now with TDMA. Anybody know what TDD is, time division duplex? You can key down continuously and talk like a cell phone. You can hear your, you know, you can hear your, you can hear them and yourself at the same time. And they're working on what's called a TDD mode of DMA, a DMR which literally you can key down and you, you and your you and the other uh, person can talk just like a cell phone. And the reason you can do that is because you're going outbound on slot one, he's coming inbound on slot two, do 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 do. Your human ear, because we're just such primitive mammals at the top of the food chain, we uh, don't know, our, our ear doesn't know that what it's actually hearing is a, a time slice signal. It, our, your brain compensates for that, yeah, some better than others, right? And, and you, you hear what sounds to be a continuous conversation. Yes, sir. Because of TDMA mm -hmm. and the two time slots, um, it's possible to have a single frequency repeater mm -hmm. where the roving units are on one slot and for uplink and the downlink comes on the other slot. I think there's one company in New Zealand making a, ma mm -hmm. a machine that does that. Have you seen any of that in the amateur space uh, or any of the other manufacturers? So I will, I personally can't validate that you know, your comment is correct, but it sounds like you, you, you are familiar with this. So I'll just say, I guess it's possible. I haven't seen a device yet that's doing, you know, a simplex repeater. But again, I'm coming from the old days where a simplex repeater was a store and forward device, right? You store it and then play it back. And that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about real-time 
mobiles come in on slot one, downlink from the, the base or the repeater goes on slot two. It certainly sounds feasible. I am not aware of anybody that's doing this. Um, if there's anybody doing this, I would take a guess. There's a company in Italy called Radioactivity Solutions. And I met the owner at the IWCE trade show last year. They have some incredible products. They do everything under the sun, simulcast, voted receive, trunking, wide area connect. They have the little AP style uh, repeaters. And the owner, the CEO, is also a, an Italian licensed amateur. We had a really, really good conversation. Um, I would bet if anybody did that, it would be either, either be them or Hytera, the Chinese manufacturer Hytera. But I, I don't know of it. But as you said, that, that opens up some very interesting possibilities. Because talk about incredible frequency um, uh, efficiency. Wow, it doesn't get much better than that. So uh, we'll do a couple more questions. Andy, what's the, uh, oh, let's see, how do I ask this? Where's the uh, speed bump in using a non moto turbo repeater on the DMR oh, network? Very good question. So it is not a speed bump, it is a uh, retaining wall. <laughs> it's a retaining wall. However, okay, so here's the deal. <laughs> Motorola has the special sauce in the networking routing protocol. When this started, predominantly all the repeaters, all of the surplus and relatively inexpensively available repeaters were the Motorola ones. So the, the network has been primarily built out by those Motorola repeaters. And I know of no way to connect a non-Motorola repeater to the network outside of using like an analog gateway. However, there is some research, in fact it's not even research, they're actually working on this right now and they're using SIP. Session initiated, was a session initiated protocol? SIP. And you know SIP is, probably a lot of people in here know a whole lot more about SIP, Cisco call routing, SIP phones. Um, they are thinking that SIP routing may be the quick and easy and elegant solution to connecting these disparate networks together because a lot of people are really angry because Hytera makes a fantastic repeater, about $1,200, $1,300 brand well, so new. Does, does uh, well, do you know who makes it for Harris? <laughs> Hytera. Hytera, yeah. yes. It is. That's because it is. And we haven't seen anything yet. The Shenzhen China manufacturers, um, stuff's going to go, literally start coming out of the woodwork. So to answer your question, the only thing that I know of that is on the horizon to get around these disparate network things is SIP. And you, don't want, you want to know something? If there's a solution that's developed, I believe it's going to be the amateur community that does it. I, I would think it's going to be us. It's going to be us that are going to figure out a backdoor or a bridge to, to get around it. There's already RLP nodes and, and other things connected to, to DMR. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've read about things, things. So there, there are people that are very, um, they like connecting different networks together, I guess is the, the way to put it. So they bridge these things all the time. So uh, one more question. Okay. This is K7AJ. Um, on your DMR uh, repeaters, can you also do analog as well? Is there a dual yes. capacity there? Yes. So yes, you can with, <laughs> with a little bit of a limitation. So, and again, this depends on the make and manufacturing. So much of this I preface with coming from the, the, the Motorola world because that's the largest proliferated amateur network. Yes, they can support dual mode analog or digital. When they're connected up to the IP site connect world, they can only support digital. Now, that's just Motorola. The other manufacturers, that's not the case. Because not everybody has crossed over to the DMR world yet. And if you're interested in doing a repeater, you got to service all people. Correct. And that's one of the reasons that P25, at least locally here, was kind of a no-brainer. You put in a P25 repeater, it within couple milliseconds of a transmission figures out from the, the header information is it digital, is it analog, and if it's analog it just passes, if it's digital it goes into digital mode. 
So yes, it can do it. The ability to do that on the amateur network will depend on what repeater uh, that you're. And remember, there are people that have built amateur networks out of Hytera equipment and non-motorola equipment. They're out there in the United States. Um, it's just that the biggest networks are built out of that, quite frankly, the, the original first generation Moto Turbo equipment. So, um, let's, you want to still do your demo? I, well, I, first, I'm here, I'm here for these people and questions. So if there's more questions, I'm here to share information. So please, you got any? Do you have any other questions? Up, I'm, I'm, so I think Andy's going to stick around for a little while. Yeah. yeah All I'll right. So, so why don't we let you do the demo out there? Let everybody else hit the bathroom and copy and everything. So I want to say thank you for Andy for the purpose. Right.